I'm very pleased to have this opportunity of presenting to you these videos. In them, we hear the experience of black Catholics in this country. I don't think any of them have been asked before simply to tell us about their experience. So listen, listen with an accepting heart. Don't be thinking, hang on a minute, but this or but that. Just make space, make space to hear what they have to say and its impact on us. There are tears and there's joy, there's sadness and there's great inspiration. Hello, my name is uh, Deacon Pascal Uche and I am really excited because in just a few weeks time I'll be ordained as the first British born black priest of Brentwood Diocese. And while that's really exciting, the fact that I'll be the first British born black priest of Brentwood Diocese tells a story itself. Hi, my name is Kamara and I am the lay chaplain at Catholic Sixth Form College in South London. My name is Caroline King and I'm an executive head teacher in the London Borough of Hackney. Within this, I run two primary schools with, which serve a very, very diverse community. I'm Father Joseph Okoro, a black African originally from Nigeria. I was ordained a priest three years ago for the Diocese of Westminster and currently I'm the assistant the priest of Holyrood Church, Watford. So my story begins in Stratford, East London, um, and the primary school that I went to was in Hackney, St Dominic's, predominantly black Catholic primary school. Uh, so I didn't have a sense of being black, I was just one of the students, I was in the majority. And that's highly contrast to my experience uh, in secondary school, where I went to Trinity Catholic High School in Woodford Green. And there I was one of two, and at a point three um, black students within my form class. As a black woman growing up in Hackney, the dominant feature at the time um, when I was growing up was very much around our education. And within the home, the, the mantra was always, the test papers out of 100, you will need to get 200. You will need to work twice as hard, Caroline, to get what you need and what you require to succeed in life. I remember one time um, in secondary school, we were talking to a girl about how she'd managed to get such amazing grades. And I remember she looked at me and said, no offense, Kamara, but I was just in a really white group. I was definitely different. There weren't many black teachers. And actually, maybe to compound the situation, the only other black members of staff that we would see during the day was, was the cleaners that came at the end of the day. There have been colleagues, friends, people that I have known in these years who have suffered the pain and the dehumanisation of racism just because of who they are. There were so many co comments made where I felt so othered, so many comments about my skin and my hair, and it was mostly questions, it was mostly people interested, but I did feel othered. There was a sense of consciously being different, of being black, and all at an age where I was still discovering what it was to be myself, to be me, working out my identity. I know my mum, for example, she found it very difficult. Uh, on several occasions, she has uh, been the victim of racism. In one instance, she was told by a parent, I don't want my child to be in your class because I don't think they'll be able to understand you. A girl had found out that I was mixed race, so I'm half English and half Ugandan. And um, she looked at me and said, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. I always wondered how you were so pretty. I thought you were just black. So I felt that there were stereotypes and prejudices just because there was a minority. And so the importance of education, the importance of being able to share your story, I think, was a gap that wasn't often really well filled. I remember a girl once saying that her dad had told her that if she brought a black boy home, she would be disowned. 
And these kind of comments would just be said, like these fleeting comments in front of me, but just little knocks to my confidence and questions and new insecurities forming. It is worth noting that when we fail to nourish and spread love, for which every human heart is made, we create a toxic monster. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, we shouldn't be differentiating between which Black Lives Matter. We should be asking the questions when our teenagers are being killed and slain on the streets. We should be asking the questions when there is mass genocide going on in the world. We shouldn't be asking the question just because our own lives ha aren't totally consumed with ourselves at the moment. So I believe that by design and God's desire, I am a black man. And that is a particular manifestation of God's goodness, of God's image. And he wants me to share that reality wherever I go. Um, my mum always talks about her frustration surrounding First Holy Communions and confirmations where she could never find um, cards that had, you know, black faces on them or rosary books that had black children. You know you, how you have the kids, like, confirmation cards and maybe they've got a blonde white girl um, looking beautiful in her First Holy Communion dress, but it's so difficult to find those kind of cards for black children. I was talking to um, a student, uh, so I mentioned I was, I'm a chaplain, um, and she was asking me about Catholicism, and she was like, Miss, um, isn't the Catholic Church just like old white men? <laughs> and I was just suddenly realising that she didn't feel that she belonged in the church because that hadn't been what she'd seen. Well, this is an issue that is deeply close to my heart because I believe, and I believe it's no exaggeration, that the Catholic Church bleeds out young, particularly black people, to either different churches or no faith at all, precisely because young black people may have not found a home in the Catholic Church. And that saddens me to say that, but I believe that is the real experience and reality for a lot of uh, young black Catholics. One of the churches that I went to in Southampton, so I went to uni at Southampton, and uh, this priest made a real, real effort to represent the multiculturalism of his parish. So he had like banners all around his um, church showing different saints, St. Josephine Bikita, um, and just looking around and being like, I see this so rarely. I so rarely see other black faces on the walls and the religious art in my churches. I'm so rarely represented. And how can young people feel empowered and that they belong to the church when they never see their faces shown around in the religious people that we venerate? I think that even just by looking at the church, we can see the symptoms of a lack of integration, which is particularly sad, given that this is our nature as the Catholic church. This happens so often where we only talk in our Catholic churches and schools and colleges about black people when we're talking about charity and suffering and sadness. You look at the clergy or you look at the leadership and um, the black population isn't represented there. We need to open this dialogue and it needs to be a constant dialogue. It needs to be one of which we are able to be honest and truthful and heard. And so I think we need to do more in celebrating the ingenuity of God in creating diversity in human nature. My own personal vocation story, uh, I attribute part of that to seeing Father Albert Ofere, a priest of Westminster Diocese, being inspired by him as a vibrant black priest, that I was able to see the reality and begin to consider and be open to the reality of God maybe calling me. And I, I always say this, that representation should feel like a conscious effort. You should feel like you're going out of your way to, to find images or to find resources because these things aren't necessarily as easily accessible as they, as they should be. I would like to see uh, priests, deacons, to preach more on the evil of racism, that we should know explicitly how contradictory this is to, to our faith.
to, to who we are. We're so privileged to have a multicultural and diverse and beautiful and big church full of so many different people of different races. But in this country, do we really represent that? And simply put, celebrating and harnessing our diversity is at the heart of creating a happy, tolerant society. And so I would say to young black Catholics that despite the statistics or the numbers in terms of representation, be assured that you have a particular gift. You manifest the beauty of God in a particular way in which you ought to discover and then share with the whole to enrich the human family, to enrich the family of, of the Catholic Church. So sometimes now we need to think about the difference between are we hearing that Black Lives Matter or are we listening to that narrative? And not listening to respond. I think it's so easy, I know I do this, to be listening just so you can find the weak points in someone's argument and, you know, make your argument clear. But that's not the point. We need to listen without getting defensive. I would like to think that we can be bold enough to have the difficult conversations, to hear people's difficult experiences, because Christ alone holds the answer to the questions that we ask. When rhetoric is translated into concrete actions, we can do better at creating a society where every life not only matters, but is accorded equal dignity and opportunity. Let's walk side by side. Let's journey with young people. Let's understand what the catalysts are when they no longer want to attend church or they no longer want to engage with dialogue with adults who are able to give them that guidance. But maybe we also need to look a little bit deeper than just the children. Maybe we do look, need to look at parenting. We do maybe need to look at where our parents' experiences as second and third, my generation who have um, children in the system, what we now are doing to equip our children to stand up constructively, to be able to formulate their thoughts and their arguments in a coherent way that doesn't lead to violence, that can lead to sustainable and positive change. How can this meaningful change be made? I would say, let love be genuine. Love with tenderness. Because we are the creation of love. And as Pope St. John Paul II puts it in his Redemptor Hominis, we cannot live as human beings without love. And life is senseless without love. If I think of myself as fearfully and wonderfully made and made in the image of like and likeness of God, that each hair on my head is counted, how can I then hate my hair? How can I then feel that I'm stupid because of the colour of my skin or unattractive because of the colour of my skin? I would also like to see um, the boldness to or the humility, rather, to be recipients of the gospel from foreign foreign priests. I say foreign, actually, I shouldn't use the word foreign. F from, from brother priests, brother missionaries. You know, we went out, I'm the, the product of, of the missionaries who went to, to Nigeria, shared the gospel there. As a soon-to-be priest, what is most important for me is the salvation of souls. And that comes through the preaching of the gospel and the ministry of the sacraments. Um, I want to finish um, with a quote by Sister Thea Bowman, who um, was a Franciscan sister in America. And I think she sums up better than I am doing what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what does it mean to be black and Catholic? It means that I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self and all that I am, all that I have, all that I'm worth, all I hope to become. I bring my whole history, 
my traditions, my experience, my culture, my song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as a gift to the church. So we shouldn't be afraid to dig deep, to to say the things that are uncomfortable, to speak about things that might seem hard because Christ ultimately in him is our true reconciliation and we should settle for nothing less than real reconciliation and proper uh, celebrated integration of the different races of the children of God. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for taking it to heart what these four people have had to say to us. I think following this you can watch the longer video that each one of them made and that's well worth it. They're so direct, so sympathetic, so straightforward in the witness that they give and in the visions that they have too. For me there's three concluding remarks I'd like to make. First, Yes, we've listened to them, and now we have to listen to ourselves. As Pascal said, prejudice begins with the subconscious or maybe conscious feeling that one race is superior to another. So we have to kind of listen and sense whether that prejudgment, that prejudice, operates in the way that I respond to people. A second thing that Pascal again said was we ought to be very attentive to his report that the Catholic Church is losing young black people because they're not having that sense of being fully embraced. And the third thing that a number of them said, and Kamara's words stick in my mind, when she said it is her deepest conviction of faith that she is wonderfully made by God. And that's true for every single one of us. And when we see diversity in our communities, then that diversity gives so many different expressions to the beauty of God's creation and the beauty of God's gift of human life. Wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God. That's true for all of us. And I thank our four speakers for the witness that they give and the encouragement and the challenge that they give to us all. And may God bless you.